this is Sports Jam. I'm Doug Doyle. My esteemed guest today is an Emmy and Peabody Award winner, Academy Award nominee, and claimed filmmaker Sam Pollard. Pollard's new film, The League, is already receiving praise and hasn't really even hit theaters yet. Negro Leagues Baseball was so popular that black churches would move their service time up an hour so fans could go to the game. If you know anything about the black church, you'll mess with service time. There were African-American professional ball players in the 19th century. But segregation starts to tighten its hold. Well, what do you do? We can do this on our own. A few entrepreneurs see that a black club can be a successful business. Rube Foster, light years ahead of his time. Effa Manley. The first lady of black baseball. Negro Leagues players made the game more up-tempo. Bunt and run. Base stealing. These incredibly acrobatic catches. The major leaguers would say that the Negro Leagues didn't play the game the right way. Really, that was saying they didn't play the game the white way. Great to have you on the show, Sam. My pleasure, Doug. How are you doing today? I'm doing fabulous, and it's because I've watched this documentary. This film is incredible. The League from Magnolia Pictures and a Radical Media Production celebrates the dynamic journey of Negro Leagues baseball's triumphs and challenges through the first half of the 20th century. And this story is told through previously unearthed archival footage, great footage, and never-before-seen interviews. It was the official selection at the 2023 Tribeca Film Festival, wowing audiences. Now, Sam, this is not your first time you've worked on a baseball-related project, you know, but uh, let's start off with why the league is so important to you. Well, you know, for me, Doug, I grew up in the 60s, uh, and uh, I live in a household where my dad was a huge St. Louis Cardinals fan, and uh, the players he really identified with that I also identified with were Bill White, you know, Lou Brock, Kurt Flood, you know, uh, even Tim McCarver, <laughs> Joe Torrey. And I love those teams, the 64 Cardinals in particular. So I love baseball. And then I knew a little bit about the Negro Leagues back then when I was 15, 16. And I knew about specifically Satchel Paige and Josh Gibson, two of the most phenomenal players to come out of the Negro Leagues. So when I had this opportunity because of a young man named Byron Motley, whose dad, Bob Motley had been a Negro League umpire in the 40s and 50s. This was something I really just wanted to jump into and get involved with because it was an opportunity now to learn about the breadth of the Negro Leagues when it started, learn about other people that I, that I knew only a little bit about, Ruth Foster, Max Manning. You know, I knew about Monty Irving, I knew about Larry Doby. So this was just, a, you know, for me as a filmmaker of documentaries and a real lover of history, of, and the, of the African-American experience. It was another opportunity to dig into a story about the story of the African-American community. You know, you work on this project. It brings my loves together, history and sports. And there's such a connection between the two in this film. And you do a masterful job of weaving Black baseball as an economic and social pillar of Black baseball and unintended consequences that you bring out about integration and providing historical perspectives. That's one of your specialties, though. Can you talk about this one in particular? Well, this was, to me, this was great because it was an opportunity. Here's, here's what I would say to you, Doug. I grew up, and the story we always told about, we were always told about Jackie Robinson was simply this. Jackie Robinson came from a group of Negro League players out of Kansas City. He got plucked by Branch Rickey. He signed with the Brooklyn Dodgers and Major League Baseball became integrated. Now, we never really knew what happened to those teams, that team that he came from and those other teams in the Negro Leagues. So this was now an opportunity to really dig into what happened to those Negro League teams after Jackie and Larry Doby and Monty Irvin and Willie Mays and Hank Aaron and Ernie Banks, all Negro League players left their teams and went to the Major Leagues. And uh, the thing I've always loved about making documentaries, historical docs, it was it gives you an opportunity to see the shades of gray. That it wasn't simply Brad Rickey, Son, Jackie Robinson, and voila, everything was better. No, there were consequences to Jackie signing, to Monty signing, Don Newcomb signing, Roy Campanella signing. 
because all of those major players came from the Negro Leagues, had an impact on those Negro League teams, and they ended up, you know, dying on the vine by 1960. So this was a part of what we wanted to tell. And I was, you know, and, you know, even the film 42 with the late Chadwick Boseman and Harrison Ford paints this picture of Branch Rickey being this wonderful savior, this gruff, wonderful savior. Okay, on the one hand, he did make a big change in Major League Baseball, but you learn in our film that he was also a cheapskate, that he didn't want to pay. He didn't want to pay these Negro League owners for players like Jackie or Don or Roy Campanella, you know? And it was took someone like Effa Manley, who was owner, one of the owners of the Newark Eagles, to challenge what he was doing, you know, not with very great success with him, but with more success with Bob, with Bill Veek when uh, he wanted to get Larry Doby, wanted to sign Larry Doby. So to me, it's always interesting to do these films because you can see the layers and, the, you know, and the shades of gray and how these stories unfold. You picked out one of the moments for me is like, yeah, Branch Rickey, Effa Manley didn't really like him because she didn't get yeah. compensation uh, for the these great players. And, and you learn it's not the dramatized version that as you just talked about with with Jackie, the Negro Leagues really suffered when those ball players, the great ones, really moved over, and the sure average players just, you know, it, it fell apart. And it was such a great time when it was in its heyday. You provide the voice for the late Negro Leagues umpire, author, and U.S. Marine, and you spoke about Bob Motley, and you garnered collections from his book, and you do a wonderful job narrating what he had to say, and it really <laughs> takes us. It takes us through, in his mind, really a unique perspective inside what it was like from the whole part. Obviously, you felt this was an important way to weave things together. Well, because here, here's his, you know, when you're making a documentary, you're always trying to come up with a new angle to enliven the story, to engage the audience. Now, we could have just had the story of the Negro Leagues, but... We felt, and Brian and Byron felt this also very, 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 very clearly, that to tell the story from the perspective of his dad would give it a different angle. You know, it would make it more personal. And one of the things I'm always trying to do is figure out how to make these historical films more personal, to make them more engaging, you know. And we felt as we went through Bob's, Bob's book, we felt there were moments and pieces that gave you a sense of American history gave you a sense of the history of what it meant to be a black man fighting in a war across the ocean when you had to come back to a segregated community, gave you a sense of what he had to deal with when he became an umpire, the challenges he faced, you know, and someone asked, we were, when we screened it at Tribeca two weeks ago, someone asked Byron, did his father have a, a, a favorite major league player? And he said his father didn't like, he was an umpire. He didn't like any of those major league players. <laughs> but he respected them. We know he that. He respected them, but he didn't like them. <laughs> you know, he died in 2017 <laughs> at the age of 94, just to give our viewers a, a perspective here. He was the last living Negro Leagues umpire. And as I mentioned, a, a really unique perspective. But also I want to talk about the wonderful uh, section in your film on Rube Foster. Yeah. Because Rube doesn't get all the credit that some of these other names that you've talked about. And even though he's a Hall of Famer and got recognized for that, he was a pitcher. He was a pioneering manager and exec. And in 1920, Rube Foster set the wheels in motion to create the Negro National League, an association of black teams molded after Major League Baseball. And as you point out in the film, he was way ahead of his time. He was. What are your yeah. thoughts about why he was so special? What were the characteristics of Rube Foster that you feel he was able to look to the future and really know what Major League Baseball looks like today? Well, he, he had what I call, you know, a larger view. He just didn't focus on, I'm just going to be a pitcher, you know, and then he said, I need to be more than a pitcher. He became a manager. And he said, I need, I need to be more than a manager. He became an owner. And they said, I need to be more than that. He said, I need to bring together other Negro League teams and other Negro League owners to form my own team. And hopefully, he was hoping that Major League Baseball would see that there were all these great players and use the Negro Leagues as a way to, to pull those players into the Major Leagues, which happened 20 years after his death. But that's what his dream was, you know. So he was really special. And I'm glad we've given him, we've presented him in a way now to an audience that they can say, wow. 
you know, we know we knew about Sancho, we knew about Josh, but man, if it wasn't for a Ruth Foster, there wouldn't have been no Negro National League. The great ball players of the leagues. Jackie Robinson. Buck Leonard. Satchel Page. Willie Mays. Cool Papa Bell. Hank Aaron. Oscar Charleston. Joshua Gibson. Would transform the game. They are a part of a movement. For we coined the term civil rights movement. Man, they didn't care about making no history. They just wanted to play ball. But the pride, the passion, the courage in the face of adversity, that's the real story. There's so many wonderful players that are brought up in this. And we just talked about the umpire. OCB Jokes was an umpire. He uh, umpired Black League Baseball, and that's the uh, the... If you can see, that's the autographed baseball I have uh, behind me here in this set. And he would oh, talk. Yeah. yeah, he would talk about going and being behind the plate when Satchel Page faced Willie Mays in a game, really? and wow. saw and saw and everybody said, "Okay, you know, throw him a fastball," and Willie knows it's coming, and he couldn't hit it. You know, but he had wonderful stories of umpiring. The, you know, and he never got promoted to the major leagues because of discrimination. And discrimination is, is a big part of this film because the ball players were facing the same thing that musicians were facing at the time, not being able to go to restaurants and lodging. The connection between ball players and musicians, and I've talked to the, the late Jimmy Heath and Monty Irvin about this when I had them on Sports Jam. They were in similar situations, so they really connected with each other, didn't they? No, absolutely. I mean, listen, you know, you could be a great musician, you could be a great ball player, but you were living in a time where, you know, this was a very, um, it was American apartheid, you know, and you couldn't eat in certain restaurants, you couldn't walk in certain stores, you know, you had to use the back door. I mean, it's when you think about what Black people had to struggle through during those times, it's it's like amazing that we survived, you know, it's amazing. I remember an experience, Doug, I was 24, 25 years old. And I went down to Mississippi to see and spend some, spend some time with my aunt. And one Saturday we drove into town, you know, downtown Macon, Mississippi. And I used to go into town and just walk straight downtown, right down to the middle of downtown. And we got to the, to the downtown with my aunt. She parked the car in the back of a general store. And she went through the back door of the general store to come out into the middle of town. And I said to her, oh, Lily, you don't have to do that anymore. But she was so ingrained, it was so ingrained about what your place was. It's amazing. It's amazing what the impact the segregation had on Black communities and Black people back then. Speaking of Black communities, you were born in Harlem. You know all about the historical yeah. scene there so well and the historical significance. Well, I'm from the Pittsburgh area, so obviously I love the fact that The League, your new film, spends a lot of time focusing on the city of Pittsburgh with the Homestead Grays and the Pittsburgh Crawfords and players like Josh Gibson, Satchel Page, and the executives who are a big part of the Negro League Baseball, executives like Tom Posey and Gus Greenlee. Pittsburgh really was, along with Kansas City, at the heart of Black baseball at one time. It sure was. I mean, you think about you think about those players and coming out of that city, those teams, and and the leadership of Cum and Gus. I mean, Gus is the first one to start night baseball, you know, in Pittsburgh. That was something we left us. Someone asked me if we left us out of the film. We left that out of the film, which we should have, we probably could have, if we wanted to make it longer, could have put in. But those those are great teams, man. Those are great players. And it's too bad. I mean, the way we describe it. When Satchel went down to the Dominican Republic, it kind of, you know, imploded the, the Pittsburgh Crawfords. But, you know, Gus Greenlee also had the Crawford Grill. You remember the Crawford Grill, you know, and the great musicians who came through that place. I mean, Pittsburgh was a major hub. You had the Pittsburgh Courier, which is part, you know, which is on equal plane with the Chicago Defender back then. Yeah, the newspaper, I love the sections about how it made a, an impact and the writers that that really made this Negro leagues come to life for people, especially even white people who had no idea what was going on. You know, exactly. eventually it wasn't, you know, the East West all-star game and things like that that brought people into perspective. But 
You have a lot of wonderful historians uh, in this, journalists, authors, including my good friend Larry Hogan, who's been a guest on Sports Jam, Andre Williams, Larry Lester. When Larry gets a tear in his eye, and if you watch this film, folks, I want you to see how he tears up during his interview. It's very powerful. Bob Kendrick, the president of the Negro Leagues Museum. I would imagine they were really almost chomping at the bit to be a part of this film, right? We didn't have a problem getting people to say yes. <laughs> no, I wouldn't think so. You know, everybody wanted to be a part of this film. They all knew it was special. And I'm going down to, uh, I'm flying to Kansas City because they're screening a the film tomorrow night at the Kansas, at the Negro League Museum. One of my favorite and most treasured autographs is Buck O'Neill. Oh, you know, and great, he, he was just such a, an instrumental player, and he's all over that baseball museum in Kansas City. Also, great music. You know, WBGO were jazz and blues and, and rhythm and blues. Great music in the doc, connections to those to those genres, like the Ballad of Satchel Page. I had never heard yeah. that one before. Where did yeah. you find that? You know, we were doing some searching on the internet, and uh, I put in Satchel Page songs, and that one came up. <laughs> Had yeah, you ever heard it before? I had never heard it before. Yeah, neither have I. No. Oh, Satchel, oh, Satchel Page. Nobody dared to bother about his age. Because he was the best pitcher that the good Lord ever made. You know, as I mentioned, Monty Irvin would talk about going to the jazz clubs with Ernie Banks in Chicago. And oh, they wow. actually had a little bit of, uh, hey, Sarah Vaughn liked me. No, she liked me. It was it was, <laughs> it was wonderful, uh, the, the connection of music. And you bring it out in the film. But one of the sad parts of this film, as you talked about it early on, is that when the major leagues started allowing black players like Jackie into Major League Baseball, it, it was the demise of this yeah. wonderful thing. And and I think a lot of people don't know that story because yeah. they just, well, in our minds, it just faded away, like you said, you know, with no consequence. It's you and me against the world. Wherever you had successful black baseball, you typically had thriving black economies. You have vendors and you have advertising. You know, people were making money from it. But integration was going to kill their businesses. It was good morally, but that progress came at a cost. White fans saw a kind of baseball they had never seen before. The people that you have in this film, the archival footage, they talk about it. They talk about players. They talk about the time period. A loaf of bread is what they're eating with peanut butter during and, and having to play three games a day. It wasn't easy. And you talk about what they faced, but they also excelled on the field, not just facing tough times. It really shows this should have happened so much earlier, Sam. And people like Kennesaw Mountain Blandis, what was he doing? He was one of the guys that really held everything up, wasn't he? The commissioner. Yeah, because he, you know, he had a certain philosophy and attitude. And it was the attitude that black people should be second class citizens on all levels. And he didn't want to for his for, from his perspective, you know, Doug, he didn't want to spoil major league baseball by having black players in the game. I mean, that's why you see he put a ban on the barnstorming. He didn't want to see black players playing white players. He didn't want to see Satchel Page playing Dizzy Dean, you know, because he felt it would taint, it would taint Major League Baseball, you know. But that is what the heart is that the people that, you know, America was going through in terms of race relations back in those period, in those times. I also find it fascinating that the appeal of the Negro Leagues was the speed of the game, being able to bunt and steal and move players along. We've almost gone backwards in Major League Baseball now. That's why they've changed the, the rules now. Yeah. Because they're, they're trying to get the game a little, give it more energy and more punch, you know. They want to bring back the type of game that I used to see when Maury Wills played, you know, when Ricky Henderson played, you know, when Willie was playing, Willie Mays was playing. They're trying to give a little more pizzazz to the game and bring up the tempo. We'll see what happens with the pitch clock and – Bad at being out of the baddest box. I can't be out of the baddest box too long. We'll see if it. Some people it says it has accelerated the game. I'm going to go see a Baltimore Orioles game soon because I live down the street now and see how it how I feel. <laughs> but I'll be honest with you. I never had a problem with the game being slow because I love baseball. 
<laughs> now, did you play baseball as a kid? Yeah, I played a little, a little, you know, a little ball out in the park. You know, I was a lousy outfielder. You know, <laughs> I couldn't, I couldn't hit a nickel, man. <laughs> in yeah. the league, you talk about the Pittsburgh Courier is one of the <laughs> instrumental newspapers, and in the headline there is basically Pie Trainer of the Pirates great third baseman Hall of Famer, said, I'm okay, bring Blacks into baseball. And they really tried to make this push. Were most of the players okay? Because we always hear about the bad ones, the people who try to spike the players. You know, there were some players who probably didn't have a problem with it. And we we could tell, you could tell. I mean, there's certain players who went to the league and they didn't have a problem. I mean, I never heard any stories about Warren Spahn having any problems with Hank Aaron. You know, I never heard any stories about Bobby Thompson having any problems with Willie Mays. But, you know, so, you know, most major league teams, as you know, by the, there was only one major league team that didn't integrate until 1959. And that was the Boston Red Sox with Mup with Pumpsy Green. <laughs> you know, they were the last team to integrate, you know. And then you, and then by the 60s, you know this, Doug, you saw, Right behind you, over your right shoulder, one of the greatest ball players of all time, Roberto Clemente, who I saw play. Me too. You know, you know, Roberto Clemente, and then you got Juan Marichal and and Orlando Cepeda. I mean, you got the Alou brothers. I mean, the whole game was phenomenal to me in the sixties. I saw Roberto play in the nineteen seventy one World Series as a young kid. The bat behind me is Manny Sanguin, my favorite player of all time. He was Manny part Sanguin. of game. Yeah. Uh, no. My favorite. And he was the guy that, you know, took the coattails of Roberto. It's the Latin players came in and, and Manny has always been an inspiration to me. And he still to this day shows up and has a, a little stand at the at the Pirates uh, Stadium. Of course, Pirates don't win anymore, but that's a whole other subject, Sam. Uh, <laughs> did you see, did you, were you, did you remember when the Pirates fielded all, all team of color? You remember that? Yeah, I do. And I talked to Doc Ellis about it. You know, and he said the Pirates were really uh, a racist organization at the time, even they though they were, because he didn't get, he felt he didn't get respect enough when he was coming up, the way he wore his hair, how he tried to live his life. And uh, he really felt that he was shortchanged in Pittsburgh, also, obviously an all-star who gave up one of the longest home runs in all-star game history to Reggie Jackson, but he was yeah. part of that, uh, that World Series club. Let's talk a little bit about Newark, because WBGO is based here in Newark. The Newark Eagles, you talked about Ethel Manley and uh, her husband, Abe, who were the co-owners, Monty Irvin, Larry Doby, Don Newcomb behind me there, Max Manning, Leon Day, all stars for the Eagles. But it seems Ethel Manley was able to satisfy these players with how she was able to to compensate and treat them. Ethel's in the Hall of Fame. Your thoughts on Ethel Manley? Well, to me, this was like a revelation for me, Doug. I didn't know much about her, you know. So when 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 my story producer started to dig into her story and tell us about how she dealt with the owners of Bloomstein, how she, you know, challenged Branch Rickey, I thought, man, you know, when you think about sometimes you should do these documentaries, turning these, some of these stories into dramatic films, this would be a great dramatic story because... You know, the question about her color, was she white? Was she black? You know, her attitude about, you know, race relations in in Newark and in Harlem, putting together a great team like that and winning the World Series in 46. This lady was extraordinary, man. You put Effa Manley and Rube Foster together, and you have probably the most powerful people that could walk the earth at that time, really, when you think about sports and business. And I know we got to let you go soon, but I wanted to talk to you. You got so many things going on. Max Roach. The drum also waltzes documentary. It's all part of the being at the film festivals too. How has that been going for you? Well, that we we premiered at South by Southwest in February. It'll be on the PBS series American Masters on October sixth. It's been playing every place. It's been playing in over in Europe. It's going to play in New. It's played in Northampton where Max taught. It's going to be in New Haven soon. It's really, and it's a, it's another labor of love for me, Doug. It's a film I worked on for many, many years. And with my co-director, Ben Shapiro, we were able to finally get it finished. And it has great people in it. You know, Randy Weston, Jimmy Heath, Tootie Heath, uh, Sonny Rollins, you know, Dee Dee Bridgewater, you know, Abdullah Ibrahim, great people in it. So it's, uh, 
it was a real, you know, I'm a huge jazz fan. So Max was somebody I spent a lot of time with from like 1987 to 1994. So I really got to know him. When it has Sam Pollard's touch on it, you know, it's going to be a tremendous <laughs> film. And you've come through not only with Max Roach, the drum also waltzes, but this film, The League. It was very emotional for me because a lot of the people that you talk about were my heroes. Even yeah. though they are in, I, I learned so much coming to Newark about people like Larry Doby and Max Manning and had the opportunity to talk to some of them at different times. So this really touched me and I want to congratulate you on a, an amazing work. I don't know how you, you have all this material and you bring it down into a consumable movie. Like you said, you had to leave some things off. How, how do you do that, Sam? Carefully. <laughs> <laughs> And with, and with a lot of patience, Doug, a lot of patience and a good team of people. We had the wonderful producer, Robin Espinola, wonderful editor, Dave Marcus. We had a wonderful cinematographer, Henry Adebanojo. And we had great producers in Jen Isaacson and Dave Soralnik. So you need a great team of people to make these things come to life. And hitting theaters when? Uh, July 7th. We look forward to that right after the holiday and right when baseball season really cranks up. Perfect time for The League by the wonderful director, Sam Pollard. It's been an honor to talk to you, Sam. Keep up the great work, and we Thank look you, forward to more films and more success. Enjoy your day. Sports Jam is a WBGO Studios production. You can hear all the past shows by going to wbgo.org slash sports jam or wbgo.org slash studios. You can also find Sports Jam with Doug Doyle on the NPR list of podcasts or wherever you hear podcasts. Special thanks going out to Magnolia Pictures and Joe Favorito for hooking us up with Sam Pollard. Until our next Sports Jam session, I'll see you at the game. <laughs>